Hello, I'm Barry Daniel and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated ethical life, avoiding dogma or any absolute appeal to authority. We are joined today by Amode Lely, who teaches Indian philosophy at Boston University. He is also visiting researcher at the Center for the Study of Asia and Educational Technologist with Information Services and Technology. He writes a regular blog in cross-cultural philosophy called Love of All Wisdom, on which I recently encountered a post he, he wrote entitled Little Conservatism, and this will be the topic of our discussion today. Hello, Amod. Welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Hi, Barry. Thanks for having me. Well, you're welcome. Okay. Well, could you perhaps begin, Amod, by uh, telling us a bit about yourself and mm-hmm. your interest in the, in the topic? Why did you choose to write this article? It was a few years ago now, wasn't it? Yeah, it was uh, 2010, so so uh, going on seven years. So I'm, I might, I'm not entirely sure I can say why I picked that particular topic back then, but it was something that I, that I thought uh, was, was worthy of saying because I think there's something really important to the idea of conservatism in the sense that is literally implied by the word of, of conserving, the way in, in which there is the etymological relationship between conservatism and conservation, yeah. you know, trying to preserve things the way that they are, in a way that includes both um, environmentalism and, and preserving existing social relations. And um, I would never say I have entirely identified as completely conservative in all, in all these respects, but it's something that I have a lot of sympathy for. Perhaps identified above all with with the idea that revolutions are bad. Other things being equal, at least, revolutions are bad. And and there's some priority that is valuable to attach to the status quo because disruptions cause so much grief to people who are used to the existing state of affairs and plan their lives around it and make things work that way. And this is not to say change is bad. It's also not even necessarily to say that the existing state of affairs is good, just that the the fact that a new state of affairs is better than the existing state is not necessarily enough to merit all of the costs imposed in the transition. And and I think, you know, I took on my my job as an educational technologist, which is my my main way of making a living um, since after I wrote that post. Yeah, I, I teach uh, in the philosophy department on the side, but that work as an educational technologist has actually in some ways confirmed my ideas in the value of literal conservatism in, in that um, in this field, we are constantly hearing about so-called disruptive innovation, which people often take as being a good thing, and I, I tend to think of as, as bad, especially just in the way that academia has has worked. You know, if we look at the most dramatic changes that the university system has experienced, at least in North America, during my lifetime, there are really two, increase, two changes that, that have been the, the largest and the most disruptive and the most far-reaching. Um, one is the adjunctification of the labor force, the, the kind of reduction of people, uh, of instructors from full-time faculty to part-time positions with, with no benefits, which you know in the U.S. can mean no health care. Yeah. And um, the other is the dramatic increase in tuitions to the point that I believe uh, a Boston University student now will pay at least forty thousand, possibly fifty thousand U.S. dollars a year to to go here. Wow. These are these are both dramatic changes. They are disruptive innovations, and I think they are entirely for the worse. You know, we are also dealing with a situation where the focus of the university has moved away from the humanities and social sciences and natural sciences to career-oriented fields, and the mission of the university is increasingly viewed as being something oriented towards preparing students for a job rather than towards making them more cultivated people and and better informed citizens. So this is a background for uh, for the fact that 
as technologists, our, our daily work is, is trying to help faculty teach better using new tools that are available. And, and I, I think that's a, a perfectly noble vo vocation, and I wouldn't be in, in it if I didn't think that. But to me, that is about taking the things that faculty have always done and helping them do them better. Whereas there is this, a widespread view that what we should be doing is disrupting everything and, and you know, ha having this kind of Silicon Valley startup culture that says, you know, let, let's, let's knock everything down and start it back up again and, and build it up from the ground up. And I, I think if that were really to happen in the university, that everything was going to be knocked down and built back up again, there'd be no place for the humanities at all. There'd be no place for tenured professors. There'd be no place for anything that I find valuable about the university and I would no yeah. longer want part of it. And so, you know, as technologists, we often encounter resistance from professors who, you know, really don't want to do anything different. They don't want to change their ways. And, and, and that can be bad as, as well as good. Um, you know, they're, they're often used to a pedagogy that's entirely lecture based, you know, kind of reading their notes at people, which has never been a very effective way to teach. And, you know, we often have justifiable frustration at that. But for me, that's always tempered by saying, well, you know, there are a lot of ways in which the fact that universities keep doing things the old ways is a good thing. Um, you know, I'd rather have universities as they were in the 1950s or before, warts and all, than have this this new vision that the the Silicon Valley disruptors who want to unbundle everything and you know have people take everything by the courts want. So all of that makes me feel there there is really something to be gained by an attitude that is literally conservative in that sense of of assigning some value to the status quo. And so just to so to go back to the, the roots of this way of thinking, I'm thinking of Edmund Burke. What did conservatism mean in the time of Edmund Burke? By many is considered to be the father of conservatism. Right. I don't mean to count myself as a Burke expert by, by any means. I'm, I'm not all that familiar with with his thought i i am basically going to going on on um a kind of educated lay person's knowledge of it sure. um but uh you know I, I may not know it any better than you do but i um have, all, have thought that there is a, a kind of commonality that what burke was always insisting on was the importance of local communities, the, the, the little platoons that, that form uh, local neighborhoods and, and their, their existing ways of, of doing things, and thought that something very bad was happening when the French Revolution radically disrupted everything and, and you know, tried to start everything from, from year zero. And I think, and I, I think, you know, Burke may be right about that. Um, you know, there, I mean, there, there, even at that point, there would have been different kinds of, of conservatism. I mean, I mean the, Burke's variety of conservatism would have been very different from, from uh, Joseph de Mest, who said there is an eternal order of, of throne and altar that should not be disrupted. And I have not a lot of sympathy for for that view, but I think that the, and maybe this sort of moves into some later questions. Is that in the time of, of the revolution, you, you know, the the idea of progressive or radical versus conservative matched up fairly well with left versus right, right. Um, in that the changes that were being made were changes in. Uh, an egalitarian direction, and, that, and that's how I tend to understand the left versus right axis: is that left wingers want to promote equality, or they want society to be more equal, and right wingers want it to be less equal, in in terms of, kind of substantive outcome equality, not just uh, equality of, of legal right. Yeah. Um, although in the days of the, the French Revolution, even equality of legal right was was something of a, of its own uh, its own revolution. And so I think what's I think what, one of the things that really sort of led me to the idea of, of literal conservatism really was sort of realizing that in the course of, of my lifetime, I was born in 1976, the engines of change have mostly been on the right, that the revolutionary energy has been from people like Reagan and Thatcher and George W. Bush who wanted to slash taxes, slash regulations, and create a world drastically different 
from the one that had existed in, in 1976 and you know, succeeded in a lot of this and made a lot of far-reaching changes. And one of the things that sort of crystallized it for me, and I think, think I mentioned that in that original blog post, in Ontario, where I'm from, um, in the 90s, the, the premier of the, the province uh, had, had this scheme where um, they, they, they would take all of the, the crown land the, the public land and t- sort of take a large portion of it to make it park land and then sell the rest to developers. So it was kind of the largest amount of park land ever made. So we'll, we'll, you know, we'll conserve this as park land and then everything else gets, gets sold off. That was sort of the, the scheme. B- basically sort of saying like, you know, let's not have this kind of general crown land that exists in, pu- in a public way anymore. Let's rationalize it all and, and either make it specifically park or make it something developable. And, and similarly, you know, they, they slashed levels of government in order to save money. There used to be a, a county level of, of government that they got, that they got rid of and, and they merged small local city governments into giant governments full of, of millions of people. And I think this is something that would have horrified Burke, you know, that, that moves away from neighborhoods and, and communities. But this, this was something that to me is extremely unconservative, that it, it's not conserving anything, it's changing everything, but it is right-wing, and because it's right-wing, it has gone by the name of conservatism. Whereas conversely, the left in those years really was basically the group that tried to conserve the welfare state that had comfortably existed in the, the mid-century, and to resist the, the radical changes put out by the Reaganite and, and Thatcherite uh, right. Now, there may be some signs that that's changing nowadays, just in the past year or two. We're in a very unusual, well, or at least a very new political situation. I think nobody quite knows where, where that is. I was supportive of Bernie Sanders's political campaign in, in the U.S., and a friend of mine uh, Pushed me on this. He said, "He said, you know, I think you can't really be uh, you can't really be the little the literal conservative that that you sometimes say you are if or if you support Sanders when you know Sanders explicitly describes what he wants to do as as a revolution. Uh, you know, he refers to our revolution. And, and you know, I, I thought about that for a while after he said that. I thought, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe I'm not a conservative in this literal sense. But I've gone back and forth on that, and, and I, I think I actually." do find it quite possible to recognize or to, to reconcile rather uh, literal conservatism with support for Sanders just on the simple basis that I that when he says it's a revolution I don't really believe him that I, I think the changes being proposed are are not that radical that um, they you know they in, including th- things like having a, a significantly higher minimum wage and subsidizing university tuition are not very big changes. A move to, to a, a national single-payer health care might be a bit more drastic. But on the other hand, I, I think I mean, Barack Obama's health care plan was, was a very conservative one in some ways because it was really trying to work with the existing system, the existing providers that were there. But we've seen just how, how difficult that's been to implement both politically and, and logistically in, in a way that's actually, that's actually fair and effective. And you know, it, it may be the case that, that it is, is better to, to make that uh, a kind of wider, to, to go all the way to a, to a single payer system. On the other hand, you know, and, where, and where I think the liberal conservatism idea may have some power in, in my thought still is I'm, I'm a lot more skeptical of Jeremy Corbyn than I am of, of Sanders. I think he is considerably more radical than, than Sanders is um, in terms of his um, disregard for some of the longstanding foreign policy alliances and, and agreements, his readiness to, to nationalize a lot of uh, services that are currently provided by, by the private sector, not just in, in health care, but, but beyond that. And in addition, his past support for the IRA, those things make me, make me nervous. And I think that's a, a conservative impulse to, to be concerned about that. Okay. It's interesting. I actually voted, most of my life I voted for progressive parties, but uh, I, I do find this idea of literal conservative uh, resonant in many ways, um, partly the, the idea that it's based on pragmatism, on the tried and tested, 
on the yes. recognition that we are finite beings, we're imperfect. And But I've recently aligned myself with the policies of, of Corbyn. For the last few years, I've been a member of the Green Party. But um, mm -hmm. And it, it's created a, a sort of dilemma for me in a little way, because I, I do recognise that some of his policies don't cohere with that particular worldview, the literal conservative view. However, I think sometimes, sometimes there are situations where we're actually crying out for change. And it's not that literal conservatism doesn't agree with change, as you said at the beginning. So my question is, um, when things do seem to have gone out of kilter, which from my personal political perspective they have in terms of well, just social justice, whether the whole idea of austerity, I think, is quite a radical act which we're pursuing in the UK. Right. Um, so how does it, that philosophy, if we could call it one, uh, engender change? I think maybe the, the one word answer would be slowly. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, and, and certainly I, I think, you know, there, there's, um, there are ways in, in which um, a, a literal conservative can recognize, you know, the, the existing order that seems to have worked well is, is threatened um, by, by in, in, in such a way that, that some sort of drastic, change does need to happen and, and happen rapidly. And I, and I think um, environmental issues are one of the big, are, yeah. are the most obvious example of that, that, you know, if, if, if you would like to see a hundred years from now, a world that is as much like the world that exists now as possible, then you need some, to put in some pretty drastic changes and, and regulations um, to, to, ma to make sure that, that the way things are going the, 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 the direction things are moving in does not does not continue um, because it is is unsustainable. I think I think any anyone who aspires to be conservative in the literal sense should aim for sustainability in all senses of that word. Now I think that, that there's a somewhat different case when it comes to to social justice because in, in that case we are kind of faced with situations where you know, we might genuinely say like. The status quo is perfectly sustainable, but we still think it's worth changing. Yeah. And I think there are situations like that, and it's in part because I do think there are situations like that that I'm not quite willing to go all the way in calling myself a literal conservative. Yeah. And I and I think you know in my my original blog post uh, on on the subject, um, you know I, I I quoted Martin Luther King because I think he he speaks perhaps more eloquently than anybody against literal conservatism. In that particular respect, it's sort of you know that I, I think you know one could have at, at the time uh, said you know all, all right we, we we recognize that there are some injustices here and and um, and and we want to rectify them but we don't want to disrupt things too much so let's let's have them move slowly and, and many people did say that to King and quite explicitly and and he is writing explicitly in response to them you know that he typically refers to them as as, as the white moderate. And um, he's saying, you know, look, um, I think I have a quote on my screen right here. Um, Perhaps it's easy for, for those who have never felt the stinging dark of segregation to say, wait, but when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers and will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you've seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, um, and it goes on for quite a long time, um, closing with when you know forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. Uh, there comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sir, as you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. Um, and, you know, I, I find it pretty hard to, to argue with King against that kind of view. In the context of his particular situation, I think the trick about it is that, you know, it, it's such a beautiful statement that people can be ready to quote it in regards to just about any kind of cause yeah. ever, even though it's the causes for which it's quoted are often are typically situations where where the situation that people are in are not nearly as bad as, as the, the one that African-Americans faced in, in the South. In, yeah. in, in. But, you know, there's there's always a balancing act. Um, I, I think with with anything, you know, there there are multiple sides to to every issue. You know, I think there, there are 
there are particular cases where it's clear that, that one side is right and one side is wrong, but I don't think, you know, the, it, it's typically a bad idea to, to say something is right or wrong on, on general principle without assessing the various factors that, that lead to the situation or that, that, that constitute the particular situation. You just said there that there's always a, a balancing act. Now, um, mm-hmm. the middle way, as we understand it, is the idea that we we make better judgments by avoiding fixed or dogmatic beliefs about things, whether those are positive or negative. That then arguably throws us back on experience, so we're less in this sort of messy, uncertain middle. But it's it right. could be said that it's the messy, uncertain middle where we we can actually start to get to grips more adequately with the phenomena that we we encounter. Now. How might that relate to what we've been talking about today? Among I think there's, there's a fairly strong relationship. Uh, I mean, in, in some of the, the other posts I, I've, I've made, I've talked about um, philosophical single-mindedness as a sort of sense of, of kind of putting everything in the service of one single principle, and that in, in a way that goes beyond politics, although it is particularly notable in politics. A, a single-mindedness, I see, is the kind of thing that characterizes communism, certainly, but also militant Islam, of the, the Wahhabi stripe especially, and certain strains of libertarianism as well, the, the kind of uh, libertarianism associated recently in the U.S. with, with Paul Ryan and the, and the Tea Party, and in perhaps especially Ron Paul and Rand Paul, that, 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 seek, that says, you know, less government is always best. And, and I think part of the appeal of literal conservatism is that it's not subordinating things to a principle in quite the same way. I mean, I think part of the thing for Burke is that even the the value of the status quo, it's, I mean, it it is kind of a principle, but its it's value is not in the fact that it is a principle. Its value comes from the experience that disruption is disruptive. And, you know, again, contrast between someone like Burke and someone like Maestre, for for whom I, who, who is, I think single-minded in in his own way. For, for Maestre, you, you know, there is the the rule of of God above the church and the church above society that that kind of fixes the way things should always be eternally for all time. And I don't think, from from what I, I've seen of Burke so far, I don't think that's his view. I think it's much more a sense that that it so happens to be the case that revolutions are generally disruptive and to be avoided. And one of the reasons that they're generally to be avoided is that they tend to be in the name of a single principle that that is placed above the warp and woof of everyday life. You, you started off this talk, uh, Amo, talking about education. And it mm-hmm. just something's just struck me that, that might bring another perspective on what, what we've been talking about. I was a teacher for many years. And when mm-hmm. I reflect on the times when I was in a staff room that worked really well, it tended to be where you'd got a a good mix between experienced teachers and new blood. And so the the experienced teachers knew inside out the tried and tested, were perhaps a bit cautious about trying new ideas and, um, you know, maybe sitting on their laurels a little bit. But that mix with the new blood who come out with loads of new ideas, um, that sort of uh, dialectic that happens, that synthesis, often produced a really vibrant staff room environment. Now, yeah. could that be could that be a model also for an effective function of society as well? Potentially, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, it's, it's something I'm kind of coming to, to grips with now that I'm in my, my early 40s and, and sort of seeing, you know, the, the new generation below me in years that, that where I think people, I, I see young people now thinking very differently from the, the way I do about, about a, a lot of issues around, around things like like um, freedom of speech and, and the, the appropriateness of, of, of allowing offense. 
And, you know, I, I, I think I was struck by, by the, the comedian Sarah Silverman um, recently sort of say, saying you know, she, had, she had kind of built her career on, on, be, on being offensive um, in, in, a, in a humorous way um, and kind of gave that up in a way that I think sort of stopped making her funny, in part because she saw the, the way that, that, that um, you know, what, what the, the 20-year-olds were, were agitating for. And, and, she, and she said, well, you know, the, the youth are, always on, are, are almost always on the right side of history. And I looked at that. I thought that's incredibly myopic. You know, were were they on the right side of history in in, in 1917 in Russia? Were they on the were, were the brown shirts on the right side of history? Um, you know, the the, the Hitler Youth. Um, the, I, I think what the, the think the thing is that youth are usually on the side of change. So you know, this perspective of literal conservatism was not one that I held when I was 20. And I think there are probably very few 20 year olds who would hold it. I mean, uh, there's, there's all, you know, this is the point where one usually quotes Churchill on this sorts of thing, but, um, <laughs> but, but I, but I think, you know, I, I think your, your uh, approach of, of the, the middle way is, is valuable in that respect. You know, even if one is taking a, a conservative perspective, and you know, again, I, I think, you know, there, there are, I think there's that recognition that, that, you know, in order to keep things. Um, the way they are, there are some things that that, that do need to change. You know, it, it, you you need to take your car for a tune-up if you want to keep the car. You, yeah. you have, the, the, there 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 is a certain way that that some sort of some sort of change is inevitable and, and natural, and and you know, at, at, even stasis requires effort. And stasis, as, as as such, is is you know that that's going to an extreme that I wouldn't appreciate it. it you know, and especially recognizing that. There are plenty of things that are unjust in society and, and always have been. And, you know, I, I, and I think I'm, I'm no longer at the point of, of thinking those injustices are going to get fixed within my lifetime or the lifetime of anybody around now. But I think that you know, things can be better than they are and in a lot of ways should be. But I, I think that there is a helpful dynamic in the 20-year-olds pushing for, for change as rapidly as possible and, and looking around and saying, that's stupid, why do we do it that way? Um, with the people who are in their 40s and up saying, well, hold on, there are actually reasons, there actually are reasons why we do it that way and, and it's actually not that stupid. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I think there, there's... There, there is a balance to be to be achieved. That yeah, I think the 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 twenty year olds often do bring a certain a certain single mindedness. That um, if society, you know, if if you if you did take uh, a group of, of student radicals of whatever stripe and put them in charge of a, of a society, things probably would be disastrous. But on the other hand, if you didn't have those radicals there kind of pushing for those changes, then You'd probably wind up with a situation of, um, you know, at at best, injustices that could be fixed not getting fixed, and at worst, uh, society really kind of stagnating and and fall apart, falling apart because it's not able to adapt. Yeah, yeah. I just like to say one thing. I think um, from my perspective, at least, the um, the middle way can often be seen as aligning quite effectively with literal conservatism but not necessarily so because um, the middle way is in many ways the the position that best addresses conditions given the circumstances but anyway um, Amod it's been a real pleasure talking to you today and, and thank you for your very interesting perspective on on this subject thank, thank you for inviting me I've, I've enjoyed this and uh, let me let me know when it's up and available will do You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.